I'm gonna talk a little bit about our participation in existing standards bodies and how we take our technologies to the point where it can be interoperably implemented across different uh, uh, implementation has been in a verifiable way, maybe with more friends than we have today. Uh, kind of like, like Lytle said, being a, a healthy and friendly and open community, bring more friends. Um, speaking of friends, like these are some of the people that work on this stuff. And I, I want you to remember these smiles <laughs> as we go through the next set of slides. Because you're going to kind of wonder how, the, how they can be smiling Turn this big. Up given the nature of some of the work that we do on the browsers and platforms team. So you, you've probably seen this slide, and this is kind of like mapping out the work that we've done across a bunch of different areas with a bunch of browser vendors. And uh, like, I just, I want to be really clear that this is not standards work. That is work that we're doing, building relationships with organizations. We're uh, writing code, we're shipping code, we're asking other people to take our code and put it in their code, or at least close to it and, and bundle it. And it's like, it's a, it's a lot of duct tape and a lot of, um, I, like, sadly, like back channel negotiations, like not public conversations, to be able to gain some ground here. And that's really, really challenging. We don't really have standards yet. And I also want to step back a little bit and, and ask, like, what does that mean? Like, what does it mean to have, to have a standard? And where does this work kind of happen today? And really briefly, you know, there are a set of standards organizations that are like our area of development internet development, you know, hypermedia protocols uh, could, could be involved in. And some of these you might know, the W3C or the ITF, um, the Decentralized Identity Foundation, we cross paths with pretty regularly, even though we don't have identity built into our protocols. Um, a lot of these are really around building something that Lytle talked a bit about at the end there, which is interoperability, which is kind of like the like the, the business juice of the web, like, like when, when, when you have interoperability, uh, businesses can work together more closely and more rapidly and more smoothly. And all these things can happen. And one of the reasons why the web has been so successful, the web platform and HTTP has been so successful, is because so many groups have implemented these protocols in ways and have tested this protocol Let's, like the interoperability. Uh, there's something called the WPT. And in the last talk, we were talking a little bit about like what are testing frameworks, where, who's done this well. Uh, web platform tests is a, is a platform for building tests for the web that is something that basically didn't exist until 2015, 16 maybe, and something nobody said was possible. They're like, there's no way you can build a, a test framework for the web. Uh, we counted at one point um, for MDN. And we found that the web platform itself across CSS, JS, and HTML, all these APIs, there was nearly 10,000 discrete pieces of the web platform. How are you going to test that? And think about all the web content going back to like 1996, right? Like all that stuff still has to work. And this, this guy, Robin, was like, well, I'm just going to make a format and, and throw it out there for people to shoot it down. Well, what happened is people were like, God, they need to change that. And they went and they did, right? So I think there's prior art for some of this stuff, stuff happening. But aside, like, the, you know, these are membership organizations sometimes. The IETF is oddly not a membership organization. Anybody can show up and participate. It just costs $500 to join their three annual conferences. But anybody can participate in the list. Uh, W3C, uh, you have to actually pay to be a member of, and there's different levels and a sliding scale, things like this. But generally, these are groups of people who uh, are kind of aligned around a shared outcome. They want their technologies to work together, and that's why they do this. Uh, some myths to break. Uh, standards making is slow. All right, like it, it really can be very, very slow. Um, but it also can be really fast, and I'll show you an example of that. Uh, another myth, and we you know, talked about this a little bit in the last talk too, which is a standard is not necessarily a document. Um, according to the W3C, a standard is when there are more than one implementation of a technology, and maybe they work together. <laughs> But out of that, you know, aligned interests of multiple people that want to see the same thing exist and have it work together, you can eventually converge on a standard. And a document may emit from that process, but not required, not necessarily. Um, another one is that businesses pay to play. And I think there's a lot of different, like, industry consortiums and standards bodies and many, many, it's like tens of thousands of these types of organizations, and we're really just talking about a few. But in the few that we do participate in, that's not really how it works. Like, it's, it's pretty tough to actually, like, so I'm going to talk about work we've done with Agalia. And the, in one of the opening conversations that I had with them, when I was like, hey, we, we would love you for you to fix some things in different web rendering engines for us where things aren't working right uh, and it's a preventing a, it's a barrier for our developers succeeding. They were like, we cannot accept money 
to put IPFS in browsers for you. That's not going to work. And I was like, oh, no, I, I know how this works. So <laughs> we like, and, and we had that moment, though, where they were like, are you the crazy crypto people coming here to ask us to add your blockchain to the web? And well, it turns out we're not. And there's a lot of stuff that we have to do to get there. But like, that was, that was their, their defensive stance, right? Like, no, this is not how this works. So it, it, it really is hard sometimes to make th things happen. This is another myth. And you know, going back to that first slide with all the browsers and how we are not standardizing our stuff yet, we're working with people to implement. Uh, I think there's in Web3 and crypto generally in blockchain world and NFTs, like people are rushing forward with new innovations, new developments, and thinking about ways that we can actually you know, result, have end user needs met in different ways that don't go through, <laughs> I know I said it, <laughs> that don't go through these standards bodies because they can be hostile environments to the things that we want to do. And the reality, I think, is that when you, you know, if you look at the slide that I showed of all the different browser vendors that we're working with, they're the same people that are sitting on these standards bodies. These are the same people that we want to adopt our technologies, and sometimes we're doing both. They're saying no in one place, but saying yes, or at least maybe, or maybe even just let's talk in, in another venue. Um, but I, you can't skip it. You have to be present in these conversations, even if maybe not active or you know, very, very involved, but at least present and aware of what's going on and understand who the decision makers are in these fora to be able to make some, like gain some ground in actually getting those decisions ultimately to go in your favor and have your technology develop and mature to a point where some of these businesses can say, yes, we will adopt that. Or yes, we do vote for, for that working group to be chartered at the W3C. And that's the thing where like, you can object at the W3C to a group even forming. You can say, I, I reject I say that my company rejects the idea of you talking about this as the W3C. Not community groups. Not community groups, but for, for full working groups. Like there's a process where you as a member can say, I object to a full working group forming around to discuss a topic or, or a standard. Um, so being present is a really key part of succeeding there. So this is a diagram that I made that kind of shows the lifetime of CSS Grid. Uh, you know, layout on the web sucked for about 20 years before we got to this point. Um, it's still hard, but it's a lot better. And a lot of designers and developers really say that CSS Grid was a real change in their ability to be productive in laying things out on the web. Um, it was around for a long time before it actually kind of built some momentum, and that momentum came from Bloomberg. Bloomberg, a massive publisher, was like, it's really hard for us to do business on the web because we can't lay things out the way we need to to be able to meet our users' needs. So they hired some other groups to implement CSS Grid and start working with the browser vendors. And eventually the browser vendors are like, yeah, it's a pretty, pretty good idea. And then some of those <laughs> DevRels got on board, right? And then what happened is, is within a very short period of time, web scale, of course, this technology was enabled, unprefixed, in all of the major, major browsers, in, and immediately the adoption of this technology went through the roof. It was, <laughs> yes, there's, there's lots of swearing omitted probably from that diagram. <laughs> but this is an idea that if we take th these ideas and think and apply these to how we develop our technologies, where we engage in these fora, we work together, we coordinate in order to increase the speed at which we can have our technologies adopted, there's, there's some models for this happening. So, I, I do call BS on the idea that we can skip standards development. I think you know, a lot of the conversations this week have been around the idea that if our things aren't working together, it just makes it harder for everybody. And that's, a, that's like some casual language saying specifications, interoperability testing, and standards development. Um, so, but one of the things we're facing, especially with our stack, is the really simplified model of how the internet works today, which is like, well, it's HTTP. You make a request and you get a response. And I mean, if any of you have looked at HTTP 3 year quick, that's not really that simple anymore. But the trust model still kind of is, which is these key components. You have HTTPS, you have the certificate that encodes the DNS name, and you have these three things that really work together to create this you know, very bounded space of what is acceptable. Um, and you know, we're, we're coming at this with a little bit more nuance. We're like, all right, we, <laughs> you could have two phones that ha are in the desert, there's no connection at all, and still with things like content addressing and P2P, they can kind of work. So you have this entirely different paradigm through which we're evaluating how this technology, like what our end users need and how technology can work. But to the standards development folks, it really just kind of looks a little bit like this. 
They're like, this is insane. This is a terrible idea. Who came up with this? You want us to do what? Is really the kind of answer that we get in some of these places, right? Like, like you've got to be kidding. <laughs> and you have to be there with a straight face and very serious and very practical and very reasonably talk about end user needs. Like, the web is not meeting end user needs today. It's locking out billions of people. Let's have that conversation. And here's the, like, you know, how do we, you know, eating an elephant in very small bites, how can, well, what are the small parts of, of tackling this, right? Um, but really, you know, he still, <laughs> even after this, you still kind of come out like this, right? <laughs> like, like, no, really. <laughs> let, me, let me talk to you about the Catalan election, right? <laughs> You're like, no, really, there's this place called Turkey. No, not the food. They banned Wikipedia there. Over 100,000 women, and people, you know, they're in Silicon Valley, and they're like, well, these aren't our problems. Like, I got, I got 5G. I'm, I'm looking forward to 6G. It's going to be great, right? So it's like a really... <laughs> ben, so even when you're talking about, like, the most critically unserved populations by not just the web, but by technology generally, you sound a little like this. And it, it's, so it's, it's kind of a hostile environment. And so we're talking about solving this whole set of problems that aren't really well addressed and not really interested in being addressed by tech, like standards developers and, and these companies today in, in, significant, in, in significant ways, right? And we started from the bottom as opposed to being like, let's get successful and then try to change things later. We're like, no, let's just change the firmament of the internet first, slowly, bit by bit anyway, right? And it ends up in a culture clash. And this is happening in places like the W3C today. So we are a member of the W3C, Protocol Labs is. Uh, we have some folks that are in the W3C as well that are friends, like Consensus and Brave and uh, a bunch of other you know, people. But um, the, there's a major formal objection to the decentralized identity spec at the W3C. Um, several major browser vendors objected to that work group being chartered three, four years ago. And then when it got to one, they jumped through all the hoops for all those years. They finally got to the point. Like they, have, they actually have a, um, like a framework for, for determining how decentralized something is. Because you know, the people were like, you can't, there's no such thing as decentralized. What does that even mean? And they came up with this massive piece of work around a, like a framework for actually figuring that out. Uh, and there's a set of use cases. And those use cases documents are fed, like really interesting to read. Um, and at the end, it got to the proposal for 1.0. And the, some of the same formal objectors uh, before said, we object. We object that, that the W3C should not approve of this being a recommendation. And there's a appeals process. And it ultimately was appealed and accepted. So DID will go forward to be 1.0. But you know, so some of the objections, like these are objections for like they were really important to these businesses that objected. They had very you know, well articulated reasons in a lot of cases. Um, there's a little bit of catch 22 there where one of the objections was there's, uh, there's not enough real implementations of, of DID method, re resolution methods, um, but the charter that they originally got specifically banned them from doing that. So they're like, come on, right? That kind of, that's where things maybe go into politics and, and other things that affect these processes. Um, the ITF, we actually do have some work there. Uh, ben is working with a contributor um, from the Decentralized Identity Foundation and Open Bazaar, um, Digital Bazaar, so many bazaars. Uh, to push forward the multi multi star set of technologies at ITF. So hopefully that will happen sometime this year. Thanks, Ben, for stepping up and pushing on some of that stuff. Uh, and then Martin Seaman is also on the quick working group at the ITF. So we do have some participation in these. We also end up in conversations at some of these other like standards bodies or standards body adjacent uh, places like the WICG is like Boris said earlier, you know, it's a forum for talking about new potential new technologies. And kind of like we were talking about where do you talk about, do you propose an IPIP for IPFS first or do you talk about it somewhere else first? Well, the WICG is a place to talk about things that you might want to do on the web a, a safe space for different and crazy ideas that the web might might not be crazy down the line, right? And those conversations can happen for a long time there. Um, as an example of what the work that we do in this group is I wanted to talk about our uh, quest to get IPFS and IPNS schemes registered 
Uh, so you can use the register protocol handler API, both in web extensions and browsers and also on the web, to be able to have a handler for those protocols on, in browsers. Um, so this has been going on for a number of years, and we partnered with uh, Igali on this. Uh, register protocol handler is part of web standards today. Uh, all the browsers implemented, but it, you know you can't. There's a safe list or an allow list of schemes. Basically, um, we were working with Agalia to kind of go through, jump through these hoops, and have those conversations, do the implementation. Uh, one of the first things that happened is that these schemes were not real names. There's a separate body that approves names strings that you can use in places like this. So we went through IANA and registered these schemes as names. Now they are real names acknowledged by this body, which then you can go to the what WG, which is the standard body that basically shepherds and safeguards HTML of the living specification, where they will only add a name to their list if it's been approved by IANA, um, and also sometimes in, implemented in web browsers first, which is, I know. And <laughs> So you get to this point where we're talking with browser vendors about this, right? And, and you really kind of have to poke. Like at first, you know, generally they're just like, nah. <laughs> and you have to poke and poke and poke. And at the end, you know, in this conversation, you get to the point where they're like, oh, like, well, what would it take? Like what, is, like, what is the criteria that you use? And actually, Mozilla had a page where they said, this is the criteria that we use. And they, you know, said we need multiple independent interoperable implementations um, as, as blessed by a standards body. So getting back to full circle, you end up going back to the W3C and be like, IPFS. And now you're back at the conspiracy theory wall again, right? Um, so it's really, and, th and this is years. This, like, we've been doing this for years. And it's still, we're still not on the list at, Zub, at, the, at the what WG. Like, it's, it's going to take, th this stuff takes a while. Uh, it's moving very large ships very, very slowly over a long period of time. So again, back to this, if, if you're not present in those conversations, like if you don't participate, you can't move that thing forward. You can gamble, you can roll the dice on a leapfrog. Uh, that's happened before, and we're kind of doing both. We're putting a little bit of energy into these relationships, into being present at standards bodies. We're also at full speed, as we've been doing here this weekend, and trying to accelerate even the development of the technologies themselves. Um, but you, it, in, in the work that we do in this group, in the browsers and platforms group anyway, we're, we're trying to participate and we're trying to engage even more people to participate in this work. Um, going back to my slide from earlier this week, even if we can have the, the most minimal viable definition of what IPFS is, it reduces the crazy, it mitigates the reactionary uh, you know, effect that it can have when we have these conversations with people. Having a, a spec that says what, the, what we want implementers to do um, I think I think uh, Lytle said that earlier, which is like, if you haven't documented what things are the state of things today, you can't talk about a delta. There's no there's no there there, uh, and pointing people towards a code base and saying that's our spec is just not like that's, that's a non-starter for a conversation point at a standards body. Um, so, if the W3C or the ITF and these different spaces are like been around a long time, they're very credible, they're respected. It's where real businesses make their decisions. If they're so hostile to our work, where do we go for things like Web 3's specification, standards development, conventions, interop, testing, all this kind of stuff? Um, we're hiring. Come join us. Maybe we make a new standards body. Maybe we, we have a lot of <laughs> we have we have a, we have a lot of we have a lot of friends in the Web3 space. We have uh, innumerable NFT platforms that are all having problems because their assets and metadata aren't the paths aren't correct. They're all different. The metadata is formatted formatted differently. Like there's like all these areas of work. Uh, wallets uh, interoperability. So like what what would a unified wallet event model look like? Across browser. So that's something that actually is happening at W3C, but it's uh, slow going. Um, there's a lot of areas where we could, like, how do, what about interoperable dApps? What does it look like when a dApp that's launched by Ledger Live works the same as a dApp that's launched by MetaMask in a browser that works the same as the one that's launched on your phone and maybe someday built into your phone operating system? There's a lot of low hanging fruit in terms of interoperability that we can get from thinking about what interoperable Web3 formats or standards or interop conventions could, could be. And, and maybe, maybe we have to make a new home for that. Maybe we just fire up a, a discuss forum, discourse forum and call it a day, right? And that's a place where like a venue to have that conversation. Um, but a lot of times these technologies exist in 
in the context or connection with a bunch of other technologies. And that is one of the challenges, like one of the reasons why I like Ignite. An IPFS you know, repo or forum isn't, isn't really enough. You need a place where a lot, like the whole ecosystem can probably at least gather and be productive as opposed to being fought against constantly. Um, so maybe this will happen. Maybe we make it together and maybe somebody else makes it. Um, but you know, still smiling for, for the most part, except <laughs> they, <laughs> You can, you can see a little pain coming through there. <laughs> so th thanks, Lytle, for all the work. He's done really a lot of the heavy lifting in a lot of these relationships. So. Thanks, thanks for still mostly smiling most of the time. <laughs> all right, thanks, everybody. So I'm curious what people think on, like, do we need more involvement in the, like, you know, long-running standards bodies? Might there need to be another standards body? Or is the problem like what we really need is a standards protocol versus like another institution or something? Like, I'm not so strong willed about that, but it's just like, what do you think? What, like, and I don't know, did you ever think about sort of similar? Yeah, we found, the, we found the, the limits of standards bodies. Like, we're dealing with some of the trade offs and, and challenges around those. But, and I think in that space of, of DAOs exploding, and DAOs to me, like, when you say standards protocol, that sounds a little like I hear Dow a little bit. Um, yeah. Cool. Yeah, that's a good answer. Oh, that's that's good answer. answer. Yeah. Like a, a, a cryptographic protocol for voting in a group of people. Set it for the part that a bunch of discussion <laughs> stuff with humans talking to humans is perhaps the bedrock of some of the stuff. So we need that regardless. Uh, I will pitch some of the people talking to each other things that are happening. The Chain Agnostic Standards Alliance, or CASA, uh, is a bunch of people who are like, there are improvement protocols for many, many different blockchains. What if every one of those improvement protocols did not have to reinvent the wheel, but they could actually point at some like shared areas so that they will work across areas? So it's very much community-driven, bottoms, bottoms up stuff. It will likely, the next meeting will likely happen around DAPCON in Berlin in mid-September. And I'll share some links in the notes around uh, CASA. Uh, I will say in Fission's experience, uh, we're members of the Decentralized Identity Foundation, DIFF. Um, we found that the process where we're iterating very quickly between um, applied research and implementation was not a good fit for our cadence. So we basically run our own um, spec process. And we have, within that spec process, talked about possibly uh, then, once things are a little more stable, uh, heading to the IETF. Um, we will be picking the IETF for uh, UCANs that we're working on because we don't think, we think it's uh, broader than web protocols, it is more like a network protocol. Um, so that, just wanted to share our, our thought process on where, uh, uh, where and why we might pick a home. And also on that point, because you know, we were looking, you know, where do we put UCAN, right? Uh, and I talked to a bunch of people that maintain lots of specs for a long time, like the editor of the XML spec and the person who invented OAuth and like, you know, a bunch of these people and they looked at you can were like, oh yeah, no, you need to move way faster than what any of these is going to do. Make sure you set up your uh, uh, IP release in advance, and uh, don't worry about it, and just keep keep rolling forward. So, like, we don't necessarily want to do like specs and process right from the get go, right? It can get moved into it over time, and that's a perfectly valid path. I think there's an interesting pattern with um, ERC standards because those tokens are naturally incentivized to attract like lots of scrutiny, lots of, um, I mean, lots of malicious actors. And so people creating new ERC standards get them audited. That's a very standard part of the process that kind of implies a level of rigor that's put into it. And then it's, right. And, and it, you know, depending on who's doing the auditing, but I think, you know, the, the, the proof is in the pudding when they get released and then you know, hackers can either attack that contract or not, right? Or we can find bugs in those contracts or not. And it seems like that environment has accelerated the standardization process in a way 
that you know isn't happening across the general web, and maybe there's some you know um, maybe there's some crystals there that that we can learn from. It's it's probably like moving really fast on the working code part and less on the rough consensus side. So uh, what I really like about the EIP process uh, in Ethereum is that it is so open and that there's like, technically there's gatekeeping somewhere along, not for ERCs, but for like the consensus modifying stuff. But you can just throw something up into the repo and just be like, hey, merge this, it gets a number done. And then people can look at it and start you know, complaining in the forum like immediately. It's the shelling point of having an ID assigned. Um, and we just have to be super clear. So there's some carnage around because anyone can do this. People are like, yeah, yeah, I have a ERC one, two, three, four. And that will end up being a real thing. Um, and, um, and that can sometimes uh, over legitimize people who are less informed about the process sort of thing. But it means you've got this ultimate short, shorthand where you're like, yeah, 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 one, two, three, four. And, that, and then you can have all of these things that point there. So it's, this, it's very loose, but it just ends up sticking up like, hey, this is the pivot point, shelling point that we're gonna talk about that is super, super useful. And on balance, I think th that's the kind of thing. The other thing is, is I helped extract the discussion out of the GitHub forum into the ETH Magicians discourse to make it more accessible and visible to people who will have input who are like, ah, actually, I'm a minority group that, uh, whether technically or otherwise, that will be harmed by this thing who otherwise would not see it in the depths of a technical only discussion sort of thing. So that's that balance of we need high signal to, lo to noise for technical collaborators who are like, we can't ca constantly be answering noob questions while also having a surface area to get input from end user needs and everything else like that. that can, yeah. And I think that's a really, really interesting um, convening balance uh, to create. I think I was gonna add, it's just like, I think there's also <laughs> a lot of people that don't want like, people that could probably contribute good ideas and or like benefit the ecosystem, be benefited by the ecosystem that like just don't want to have a GitHub account because maybe they're not from the US, maybe they don't, they're mad at Microsoft for stuff they did 40 years ago. Like that's its own barrier, that's its own practical accessibility inclusion barrier for some smart, nice people. So Dietrich, correct me if I'm wrong, I, I'm hearing a couple of things. These are my assumptions. Uh, one, participation in these long multi-year things, as some of us who run smaller startups have mentioned, we just, we can't hang with that. And one of the huge advantages of PL being a bigger org, more capable of supporting that kind of infrastructure. Feels like a, an important, and so me as an operator of one of the smaller orgs, my, the question that I'm wondering is, how do we support this multi-year effort from our position within the community? And I think the things that I'm hearing are You've made two very explicit requests, a, a clear declarative spec of what IPFS is to help disambiguate what it is not, and a series of multiple implementations that are legitimate that can sort of point to that. How does that feel from a us supporting your multi-year effort perspective? I mean, that, that, that vision of the world. That vision of the world sounds fantastic. I think that is related to kind of this longer multi-year, multi-decade path of what the web itself is. Um, so I think that's what we're probably gonna do either way, right? This group of people is gonna be implementing IPFS. Now, when it comes to support in these types of environments, oftentimes what we go do is actually, you know, we go, Lytle and I will be like knocking on people's doors, being like, Hey, Textile, can you comment on this issue with the what WG? And one of the challenges is that there's, when it's just PL, it's not a lot of voices. It's just one voice, and we look like the conspiracy theory wall guy, right? Like, and when there's a lot of voices saying, this is my business, this is how I use this technology, and it's a barrier for me because it is not standardized, and here's what the barrier looks like, in fact, on my ability to do what I'm going to do or whatever, right? So that ends up being a lot of, Part of the friction between the Decentralized Identity Foundation and W3C, for example, is major players in W3C saying, well, this is not really like legitimate. Nobody's really using this. And the DIF has to be like, actually, here's these 76 different businesses that are all already shipping this stuff, right? And so there's some, some disjoint there. And, and one of the easiest ways to support 
is when we make that call, like, it. yeah, it's just come and make a comment. Say like, hey, my name's Brendan. I implement IPFS. Here's why. Here's my customers. Here's my use cases. Well, you know. And I just want to point to, I think that's like, we're super bandwidth constrained. Uh, I think that's like, to me, I just want to highlight. Sometimes we like, does this work? Should we improve the system? Like that feels exactly accurate, right? Like we're super bandwidth constrained. I do not have time to wander through WC3 halls of enlightenment. Zero time for that. But if you pull me aside and say, hey, Examine this. I, I have separated the signal from the noise from you. And, and ideally, that's a call to all of us in the room. If Dietrich sends you an email, answer it. Think of that participation in your customer development budget as an entrepreneur. Like, right, but like we got IPIP, we've got, like, we got to choose how we're going to figure out how to stratify our contribution, right? So I think this, I think this surface, surface is something really interesting. Uh, I don't think there's actually been enough talk about this at this event. And I actually had one person ask me, what is PLN? Um, uh, and I'll say it for the record, which is the Protocol Labs network, which, which is meant to be a superset of PL and multiple um, uh, companies, orgs, uh, et cetera, that, that operate in a, a, a networked org uh, style. So one of the things that I'll propose is that I think that there are, like, there are people who are doing standards one way or another across the PLN, across multiple things, and that it will be good to have a good backbone of people doing these things and uh, remove it as only a PL responsibility while understanding that there is various uh, backbone and convening and other things like that that can be handled there. And that uh, I want to actually do this with open source uh, code and contributions and things like that as well, let's follow the same pattern. Whereas I may, in fact, look over at, at, at Brandon and say, hey, um, we're going to fund new headcount. Do you want them to work for you or us or someone else? I've got X dollars for, per month for that uh, FTE that we want to fund. Right? Like, th this is new stuff that we haven't really done before, but in the same thing like you brought to the table of like, oh, well, you know, there's this new stuff that's ERC and they came up with a slightly different method. I think unfortunately what we still have to take on is yes, there's 30 years of away standards are done. There's new things of doing things and we're gonna be in this new experimental phase. So we need to keep going in, in new patterns. And I wanna actually just say again, uh, thank you. Um, Lytle, we're going to turn that frowny face upside down. <laughs> and I agree with most, of, or 100% of what Boris just said. And also, like, PLN is better than PL. And, like, as someone who only recently joined, like, if a bunch of people are doing stuff at the WHC and they're like, oh, we're all working at different companies, but they're all alphabet companies. That still wouldn't be very legitimate, um, ethically speaking, or in a lot of people's ethics, at least. And so there's a risk of being even, even PLN is potentially not as ideal for external people who are not economically incentivized as other things.